Hey there, SolarLoon here, and this is a little bit of a devlog video. It's been a little while since I last did this. <laughs> so, hi, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I'm a uh, wannabe <laughs> hobbyist indie, be uh, indie game developer, and uh, for the past uh, couple of weeks I've been working with uh, Go, the Go language, and uh, Raylib, and making a game, a 2D adventure game, top down. Uh, it's going to be a story based game, kind of like. Um, I guess you could say a lot of games uh, that are top down, uh, not so much focus on uh, on action, but more so on a uh, character development and, and stuff like that. So I just kind of wanted to go over uh, what I have and, and uh, the changes I made and how it's currently shaping up. So this is what the game looks like so far. This is in debug mode, so that's why you have the squares around the character, uh, things you can interact with, uh, collision objects. Uh, white is something that you can collide with, yellow is a NPC that you can interact with. Uh, and yeah, that's the current state of things. Uh, I have eight-way movement, I have collision, I have uh, transitions from scene to scene. I have uh, weather effects, uh, a weather effect at least, like rain. Yeah, so it's all working out. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to show a little bit of what I have and how it all works. Uh, and there's actually kind of a lot here so far, and I've only been do working on this for a couple of weeks at this stage. But it's, yeah, there's a lot here uh, right now, which is really, really great. Um, uh, I have flags, I have uh, dialogues and stuff like that, so I'll show a little bit. This is a test to do automatic new lines when necessary, so it kind of does the typewriter, you know, stepping along the, the text a little bit at a time, um, in, in, you know, by each letter. Uh, and I also have automatic new lines there. I have manual new lines support. Uh, String literals and go work, which is nice. And then I also have choices. Like this. So you can choose, and currently I have a space for five different choices. Uh, it might be better to have space for four, and you can just cycle, like it, it might be better to just have space for four or something like that, and scroll when you go down or up. That way you can kind of, I can have more, rather than having it like this where the maximum is five, and it's looking a little a little unprofessional, but it also looks kind of nice, <laughs> the way the colors flash and stuff. Um, so, for example, you know, you can have you have choices, so you can ask different questions, or make different choices. And I also have flags, so each time uh, I ask this little uh, dialogue where it says, do you have any further questions, it increments, essentially, it increments uh, this little variable up here. In debug mode, it's showing this. Normally, it's not going to show this, but just for debug purposes, it shows uh, how many times I've asked this question, and once I asked uh, 10 times or thereabouts, it'll go ahead and, and basically say no more questions. That's enough questions for now, because I asked 10, 10 times. And then when I go back, it won't actually ask the question again, because I have uh, flags. So basically when you have, uh, you know, when something happens enough, uh, I can check to see how many times something happens, or if you have something in your inventory, and change the dialogue and, and events accordingly. Uh, this is just an unknown message code. Basically, this this happens when uh, if you have a well, I'll explain a little bit more about the message code system. But basically, uh, rather than manually, and I'm using tile to make my maps, rather than manually putting the text and everything into like a sequence for each individual NPC, I'm just using a code that indicates what uh, in like how what sequence of events the NPC should uh, execute, and that's defined uh, in my code here in NPC codes. So if your code is zero, then it does this entire thing. So this is how the code the uh, code system works basically. It's just a kind of an ID system that allows you to uh, tie a code to uh, tie code to uh, you know a sequence of events. Uh, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, the kind of something that's interesting is the each action here Basically, this is a list of actions that I could do this uh, simpler. I'm using this process of appending it to a blank uh, list here, a blank uh, slice. That's that's unnecessary. I could just write a, a slice literal some, somehow, like uh, this, I guess. Yeah, that seems like it'll work. Oops. Didn't mean to bump the, uh, the microphone. Sorry about that. But basically, yeah, okay, that'll work. So, there we go. Now we have slice literals, or does that not work? Uh, oh, there's a comma there. There we go. So now we have slice literals rather than using a, a, 
and pinning them to a blank uh, slice that doesn't make sense. <laughs> slice literals is a much more logical method of doing this. Yeah, cool. So uh, basically my action system is just a list of actions. Each action is uh, defined in the actions list here. There's a variety of different actions. Um, for example, there's uh, one that displays a message. There's one that displays a choice where you have a basically a message that is, there's displays and then choices. And you have one that is uh, something that waits for a certain amount of time. You got one that uh, labels a, a section uh, of uh, sequences and then you can jump to it with a go to or jump action, go to label, it's go to label action. Uh, and so basically the way that go, go lane works is uh, there's no such thing as classes, you have structs, uh, you can associate methods with structs, and then you have interfaces where you can say like a struct inter implements an interface if it uh, implements or has functions, if it can, if it takes, essentially takes functions that uh, work with uh, all of the functions in the interface. So for example, for something to be an action, it has to have a trigger function, a done function, an automatic advance function, and a re reset function. And if it does, then it's an action. So in order for me to create a new action, I just basically define an action, a struct uh, of whatever name. It doesn't have to have any actual data inside of it, but the functions associated with it, I have to have a uh, trigger, a done, an automatic advance, and a reset, and that's it. So there's a couple of uh, ones, like this one, that's basically, there's not very much there, or I guess this one is a better example, uh, the end action, where it just ends the interaction sequence. Uh, this is useful if you say like you're in a sequence of events like oh you're communicating with a, an, a character or something and you don't have enough to continue then it'll just end the dialogue prematurely um, or whatever the case is so it, there's not too much here it just basically um, has a trigger a done an automatic advance and a reset automatic advance is basically what determines if the uh, uh, event should just automatically kick forward uh, when you get to it like for example setting a flag you don't have to trigger it. It just it should automatically just move forward. Go jumping to a label, uh, again, you, it just should automatically do that. It shouldn't. You shouldn't have to do anything for that. Um, yeah. So let me think here. Hold on. Uh, the go to label function. Actually, yeah, I can do this. There we go. Uh, the go-to label function is built in such a way that it'll jump to a, a label, uh, but there's also function a function pointer it can take, where uh, it'll go ahead and uh, determine if the evaluate function retur you know returns if it works, then it'll go ahead and move to it'll actually execute the, the jump. So that's useful because what we have here is an if flag, where basically uh, if it does go ahead and and uh, evaluate this the sequence, then it'll uh, move forward. Uh, it will uh, rather uh, execute the the uh, the jump. So here's an example. Like we I we were seeing previously, where you can talk a certain amount of times, and then it you know, once you hit ten, uh, it says basically no more questions. Like this. No more. That's enough questions for now. That's done here. So basically, after it does this 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 sequence, it has a label where it says questions. Well, actually, that's not not important. Uh, it has a, uh, you know, it's adding the flag where it says, okay, you asked a question, but then it says, I guess this could be switched actually like that, but it says if you, uh, basically if the game flag for asked is, is greater than or equal to 10, then we just jump to enough, which is down here, label enough, that's enough questions for now. And so it just goes, oh, your, your flag succeed, or, or uh, at least 10. You know, you've asked at least 10 times, just jump to enough. That's the end of the, the interaction. It just jumps down here, which is cool. Um, another way I could do this would be to uh, pass in, instead of the, the string itself, I could build the function to pass in a action. So I could say, okay, so if you if this happens, then do something else rather than just do, uh, jumping to a, a label. Like actually I could put another action in here, like another choice or a an add flag, or I'm sorry, a label or something like that so that's something I can consider <laughs> I don't know that might be a little much because that once you start doing that you get into like branches and stuff and I'm not sure if I want to do that yet uh, the label system is a little clumsy but it's not too bad 
mainly because it does give you the option of kind of fr more freeform uh, jumping. So like, you know, the, this system uh, basically says, okay, you know, whenever you get to a certain area, it just automatically you can like, you can jump to, for example, this section where it says where, you know, where you answer to the, you, you give an answer to the question where. Here you say, oh, uh, you know, where am I? And it jumps to where. So here's where. And then it says, okay, display this message and go back to the questions, which is up here. So, like, that system works. And it's a little freeform because, like, I can jump to here to where from somewhere else if I wanted to. I could jump to, you know, here, uh, who, from somewhere else if I wanted to. So it's, it's a little clumsy, but at the same time, it's a little freeform too. So I kind of like that. Um, where it's not straightforward. Uh, you know, this is something to just make it a little, a little easier to to see exactly how it all uh, works out here. But that's basically how it, you know, you can kind of see it a little easier. You have a label, you have a, a message, and then you have to go to, and then it jumps back up to your, up here to, uh, to this label questions. So it's, it's not too hard to view, visualize, which is cool. Um, yeah, so that's something I really like with Go is the fact that you can pass function pointers so that you can do stuff like that where I can actually just create a function that says, oh, does this work, basically? Is this true? If so, then run this code, or you know, jump to this this uh, section of, of dialogue. Because I mean, or, ordinarily, you probably would, I would have like an if flag equals, or an if flag is greater than, or if you know whatever. And it's like that's really kind of a lot. When this really, it, it doesn't even have to do fl uh, if flag. It just could be if. This is just an if statement essentially, and. Uh, like if go to basically this all that all this does is just go to uh, you know execute the go to create a go to action where the um, where the uh, evaluation function is an actual is an actual uh, you know a function where we can say oh you know did did this happen. So it doesn't have to be a specific flag. We could say if the player's at a specific point in the in world in world space, or if the player has a uh, an item in his um, in his uh, his inventory, or if you know it's raining, or if you know your your clock is at a certain time. Like if it's greater than eight o'clock, then you know do this. If it's less than eight o'clock, then do that. Like if if your actual you know system clock is at a certain time. So like there's a lot here. Just with an if function, so that, that's really nice because that's really free form and it's not very complex. It's really short. Um, it's not like a super long like function literal or something. It's just a really short you know func bool and then that's it. Very nice. I love it. Um, okay, so that's pretty much how the action system works. Uh, something else I'll go into a little bit is the rain. Uh, the rain system is. Let me see here. It's in weather as in main so main does some stuff here uh, basically it draws weather let's see here actually the map draws the weather right let's see yeah okay the map draws the weather basically after everything else it draws the weather because for the most part it's going to be over everything so uh, the weather system is uh, kind of interesting because originally I came up with a, a single I was it, it, um, what's the word I was actually creating raindrops and simulating them each individually and then after some time when they hit the ground I would go ahead and spawn this little this little puddle and it worked it, it worked but it was really it felt like it, it wasn't very uh, performant I was still getting CCFPS but I felt like it kind of lagged a little bit I could kind of sense like it was kind of lagging a little bit and it also felt like there must be a better way to do it because that's you know hundreds of raindrops it didn't like that's not a good idea so what I did was I decided okay let's change this up a little bit let's use a, a render buffer so what we're doing now what I'm doing now is drawing the rain uh, the rain uh, the raindrops to a basically a, a texture and then I'm scrolling that texture across the screen so you can actually see this if I break off after starting to draw one of the buffers so this is one of the of the buffers just one so you see how all the raindrops are traveling at the same rate. That's because they're all on the same texture. But because I have multiple buffers, I have like four or five buffers. It's the illusion is broken because a lot of the raindrops, they, all the the buffers travel basically at different rates. 
uh, it's random, but you know, they all should travel to different rates, and so you get this kind of feeling like each raindrop is, is moving individually. That's cool. Um, it's kind of got a 3D feel, and that's because I'm, I'm kind of doing a Mode 7-ish like 3D effect here. Um, this is what it looks like normally. Oops. Yeah, this is what it would look like normally. So it's it still looks great. It looks you know really nice, like rain. Uh, but I thought I wanted to kind of stretch it out and make it feel more a little more three D, just as a cool effect. And so this is the section of code that does that. And there we go. Nice. So how this is working? Uh, I got the I, I got inspired by this, or, or I, I guess you could say inspired. Uh, to this by uh, Ebiton. That's another Go Lang um, game library. Uh, there's no 3D in, in Ebiton, uh, but there's a Mode 7 demo. And how they do it is basically what I do here, which is essentially I take a texture and I split it up by in sections, and then uh, draw it in in sections and kind of shrink it horizontally along uh, as it draws down. So I'll see if I can let's see. I have, yeah, it's right here. I'll exam. I'll give an example here with a. Oh, oops. Give me a take a screenshot. I'll give an example here by let's say a 16 by 16 thing here. So like ordinarily, you know, you would draw a texture, you know, just like this. You just ask the, the game to draw it and it draws like this. Or, um, well yeah, what I'm doing is basically drawing something like this. So every row down, every two pixels, I'm drawing it slightly thinner so that it gives kind of a 3D feel because the top is you know, closer, essentially. The top is bigger and the and the bottom is farther. So it gives kind of a feel as, as a shri of shrieking down. So that's how it works, essentially. I'm just, you know, I'm setting the destination rectangle, uh, I'm sorry, source rectangle of where it should read, destination rectangle of where it should draw, and I'm stretching it out. So you can see that here in the width, it's the uh, texture's width times 1.5, a little bit wider so that, you know, when we shrink it down, when we kind of feel like that, it doesn't get to uh, it's there's there's still rain in the corners, so it's still like it's a little bit wider at the top, you know, kind of wide, and then uh, it shrinks down, but at the bottom it's still basically filling up the entire screen. Uh, but essentially, we're we're taking the width, which is let's say 1.5 times the the screen width, but then we're subtracting from that for each row for each row that's drawn, we're subtracting from that the uh, the y position. Uh, yeah, and this times one is just uh, a little bit of a factor for me to kind of tweak it. So you can see, like, if I set it to 0.5 oops, and test, the stretch is it's not very strong, right? It's just it's not very a very strong, very strong bit, uh, bend. But then if I set, set it to two, uh, apologies, there we go. If I set it to two, this is going to be. Yeah, now it feels almost like it's being sucked down, right? Like the rain is just like completely going down. But there's also no rain down here because the texture is not wide enough. Basically, to, you know, horizontally at the top to uh, touch these areas. But basically, you can see the, the effect. It almost looks like it's being, yeah, like I said, being sucked down to the bottom of the screen. But it's a cool effect. So one uh, times one seems fine. Uh, and I'm also doing every other, I'm just like doing it, like I mentioned here, where I'm drawing each row like this but I could draw each individual uh, with each individual row if I wanted to because I think that uh, with the size of the there we go yeah with the size of the screen that I have that's still performant goes a compiled language so it's still a fast language it can do it uh, but there's not really a huge need to do that um, but the lower the resolution the lower the row height the better generally it looks it looks a little, I, I think it looks better. It might not look significantly better. Let's see if we go, let's say we go 16 as the row height. Yeah, see, it's like blocky. It's like, cause you can definitely see, like I'm just drawing, you see how it's working basically. The illusion is breaking. But like once you get below, let's say like, Four, it looks pretty good, so I'll go with I'll stick with two. So that just cuts down the uh, amount of calculations a little bit. Four, four would probably be fine. But that looks pretty good. 
And then as for, uh, because it's just a texture, I'm drawing, on, oh, drawing it over the screen, but I'm just scrolling horizontally uh, along with the camera because that makes sense. So that, you know, when you move to the left, you can't see the rain that's, any raindrops, like it's, it's scrolling along, it's not just like sticking static over the screen. Uh, but I'm not doing it hor uh, vertically because that looked weird. Uh, it was like you could move up and the raindrops would stay almost in the, like stay, stand in position because like you were kind of scrolling along and it didn't quite look right. Uh, but yeah, you don't really, I didn't really need to vertically scroll it because it just, it made more sense to basically uh, keep it the same vertically because uh, of where the camera, how the camera is positioned. It just doesn't really make sense for you to be able to see vertical raindrops, like more vertical raindrops as you move up. Like you're, it's, it, 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 it looked weird. It looked weird. So just having the horizontal scrolling uh, worked really well. All right, uh, let's see, what else? This is my to-do list of all the things I've done. Uh, so I did an interaction system, I set up Git. Uh, I did a key binding system and a game bad input. Uh, the key binding system is pretty, <coughs> excuse me, pretty straightforward. Let's see where I have that, input actions. So yeah, it's basically a map. Essentially, it's just a map of uh, a string to values. Here we go. A map of str a string to values. And uh, we just have a function that basically loops through all the set actions and says, oh, you know, all right, did you press a key? If so, uh, set the action to, you know, one, two, or three, depending on whether the key was just pressed, it was down, or it was just released. Same thing for the gamepad buttons, same thing for the gamepad axis. Axis, axis, axes. Uh, and then we have functions that say, was the key, was the action pressed? Was, is the action being held down? And is the action released? Straightforward. And the player makes use of it here. So if the action is down, up. If action is down, down. If action is down, left. If action is down, right. Uh, this could be simplified by making a function that is like system action is down that returns it a, a zero or a one. That way I could just say uh, p dot movement dot y equals negative system dot action is down. You know the the number version up. Uh, and then I, I can also add in like plus the same one for down, so that might be something I consider. Uh, I simplified this collision system before I was basically uh, colliding. It was kind of more complex because I had a system where the level map uh, would. Let me see here. I actually, I think I still have the the function for it. Yeah, so basically, before I returned a list of rectangles that you're colliding with, or a list of collisions, which are this uh, struct here, you have the rectangle and the collision type, like if it's solid or whatever, um, that worked, and then I would loop through the collisions to say like, oh, uh, you know, you're colliding with, uh... okay, yeah, so then you, I say like, oh, you're colliding with, uh... you're colliding with, you know, uh, an object or whatever. And I would loop through all of the collisions <clears throat> because I was like, well, theoretically, you could be colliding with multiple things, right? Like, you know, you, you let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, you might collide with this object and it pushes you out, uh, you know, somewhere around here. But then you're colliding with two other objects, so it should push you out continuously. But then I was like, you know what? That's just it makes it more complex. It makes the more comp more code more complex. And, it, you know, simplicity is is good. So I just basically said, let me just make a function that tells me if I'm colliding with an object. And if so, returns the collision. If, it, if I'm colliding with any any uh, solid object, and if so, returns the collision. And if so, uh, if it is a solid object, I guess that I don't need to do that anymore because I know it's a collision. Uh, it's a solid object because it's a solid check. So let me actually, let me double check here. Yeah, okay, so yeah, it is looking specifically for, yeah, I think it's looking specifically for solid collisions. So there's no point in even doing this solid, uh, this second end collision type is solid because we already know it is. So, yeah, so basically this is a much simpler approach where I just say, oh, if you're colliding, then move back essentially according to the width and height of the uh, rectangle. Uh, something else that's kind of interesting is that with Raylib, uh, with the collision rectangle uh, functions, you can get a rectangle returned like you, you can get a result like yes, it's colliding between two rectangles, 
but the actual width or height is zero, which is bananas to me. Like, if you have a rectangle, well, I guess that's not bananas. I guess that's not bananas. But like, if you have a rectangle, this is an example. Like, this is a rectangle, right? And then it's colliding with this other rectangle, like this. So, Braylib would be like, yeah, they, these are colliding. And it's like, the, the actual intersecting rectangle width is zero. There's no, they're not actually colliding. Or, I'm sorry, they're not actually intersecting, they're colliding. So, what I basically am saying is like, you know, if, it, if it's not actually, yeah. I'm looking for intersecting, not just... Uh, colliding but intersecting so that's why I, I specify here if the rectangle that you get between these is uh, zero then basically that's not a collision because we're, we're testing for collision with movement so like if you know uh, this was the player here and this is a wall it's not colliding there's no problem like if he's here and he moves right one that's fine if he's here and he moves right one now that's not fine he needs to move back one right so now he's, he's back where he should be same thing up here but if he moves in too much, then yeah, the, the rectangle should be like this. Oops. Should be like this. That should tell him like, okay, you're in here by this much. So you need to move back by that much to get to come back. And there you go. Yeah, so that's pretty much how it works. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Okay, the map system, yeah. So I talked about the map system a little bit. Transitions are handled. Uh, I have it set up in such a way that basically uh, transitions are something that's drawn over the screen and the transition executes uh, oh yeah that's right so uh, I set it up so that basically you can have a map be active at any given time like basically the only thing that specifies a map as being quote unquote active again active is basically you can't you can't see my, my cursor or my my air quotes but active is just basically a variable that says current map so that determines what the current map is and what's being updated and what's being drawn that's really all it is okay for some reason it's, it's thinking I'm there we go uh, that's really all it is so that's cool that's good because basically that allows me to do something like this where I can load maps up and uh, and uh, you know have them in existence and I can switch between them and they their state can persist and I can come back and they're they're still you know they're still there they're still doing their own thing so you can go out of this room let's say and uh, come back here and be you know spawn somewhere let's say let's say here and you come back and you go like that then it transfers back to here so you can you know I can do that kind of stuff and anything that's it, that you set or did in here uh, will stay around stick around uh, and you can you know that will exist which is great um, right, so the transition system is handled uh, by, let me get to my level map here. The transition system is handled just, uh, it's, it's, the transition system is kind of external, but basically I just have a couple functions that basically are, exist on a, a level map, on a, on a map uh, that determines if you're trying to go to another screen, and then if so, uh, it sets that map to the next map and starts the, the fade out. Once that's done, uh, you, this, this function is called every you, you call this function when you go to, want to go to another screen, another map, and then once you do that, uh, it'll do this. You, you or well, this function runs every frame basically to determine if the next map is ready, whatever it is. So it says, okay, uh, it basically returns a pointer to the next map if it. Well, it returns a pointer to the current map, or the next map if it does exist. So it says, okay, so you're going from the current map to the next map. It does exist if it's not nil, and the system's. Uh, finished fading out, then it'll go ahead and set the next map to be the actual next map, set the level's next map to nil, because it, you already went from one map to another, you're good. Uh, from, you know, going from map one, you you call go to next map for map two, so map one is now leading to map two, it starts to fade out, this gets called, and it says, okay, um, you have a next map for, you know, map one is going to map two, it's done, return map map two as to what you're where you're going, and set map one's next map to be nil because it, it's done it transferred over there already and then it starts fading in so if you fade out once it's done it starts fading in and that's it so now we go back to main and at the end of our uh, update loop we just set the current map to be the next map set the current map pointer to the next one if it's ready and that's it <clears throat> uh, we draw the transition after everything else including gui that probably should be actually here just in case we want to draw some GUI on, on screen, we probably want to draw it before uh, the GUI. 
It's that, you know, if you go from map to map, you don't fade out over your, you know, me message box or whatever the case is. <clears throat> if you're drawing something. Uh, well, I don't know. I have to figure out if I want to do that. I have to think about use cases for that. Uh, but we update the transition, which is basically just uh, doing some easings, which Raylib comes with, which is nice. A couple of easings uh, going from, you know, kind of sliding in, sliding out. Uh, and then drawing it on the screen is just uh, drawing a rectangle. That's it. And so, the game's coming together. Yeah, so it's working really well. Um, that's a that's about it. I've been talking for a, oh wow, it's been thirty minutes. My goodness. Well, this was kind of a, a first video. I, I if I make more uh, devlog videos, I doubt they'll be this long. Uh, this was a lot of content. This was a lot of explanation. Um, yeah, so I probably should have held some stuff back for the for the next video, but no. This is what I did. This is this is a dev log video. That's the point of, of uh, a development log video is to log your development. So anyway, that's about it. This has been fun. It's been real. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for watching. And hopefully, I'll be able to keep making uh, this game. I think it's a cool, uh, cool, cool game. I think it's looking pretty good. I think it's shaping up pretty well. I think the systems are are getting there. I think uh, Go is like not fighting me on a lot of stuff. It's it's really clean. It's really straightforward. I like it like it a lot so thanks for watching uh you stay frosty <laughs> see ya oh yeah and if you want to support development uh i'm sure there will be links in the description uh youtube uh, or rather paypal paypal patreon um you can get my games on steam or itch uh you can buy my music on get bandcamp whatever anyway thanks see ya